Vietnam, in Japan, in Australia, in, in Brazil, in, in Chile, in Argentina, in Phoenix, in Las Vegas, you name it. But at a certain point, after we evaluated all the information together with the German police, we reached the conclusion that the key to the case is Albert Heim's illegitimate daughter, Valtru Daharcha, who was living in Puerto Montt. Now, she was under surveillance for quite some time, and she went many times, she traveled many times to Baralocha. Likelihood, we felt that there's a very strong likelihood, and the police also agreed with this, that he was somewhere in the corridor between Puerto Montt and Baralocha. I went to Baralocha to sort of bring the message, explain to the people who this guy is. Because all we needed was one person. In other words, if he was being helped, someone that age needs help to hide. It's very hard for a person that age, and he was, I think, 93 at the time, to, to pull this off by himself. All we needed to do was turn one person, and we were offering a prize of 315,000 euros for the information that would lead to his arrest. But a couple of times we thought we had him. We met someone who worked for his son-in-law, who met his son-in-law coming out of a supermarket on an island opposite Puerto Montt. And he asked the son-in-law, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to help an elderly relative. And this guy, who knew the son-in-law very well, knew that he had no elderly relatives on the island. And at the same time, he had like a dacha in a very secluded forest on an estate on the island, and we were convinced that's it. That's where he's hiding. But it was checked out, and, and it wasn't him. In the meantime, his son, who several months previously had said he hadn't seen his father in decades, told German Channel 2 in the New York Times that his father died in Cairo in 92. But there's no body, because according to the son, the father had converted to Islam, and before he died, he wanted to donate his body to science. But the Muslim family that had adopted him following his conversion uh, was very upset because that's against Islam. So they stole his body and dumped it in a pauper's mass grave into which thousands of bodies are dumped every year. Now that was 17 years ago in 1992. So go find his body now. No body, no proof. What about Alois Brunner? He's in Syria, you know, he has I been there for decades. I think a strong likelihood that he's dead. We, we received information from someone who worked in the German Secret Service that apparently he's dead, but that also has not been proven. Because he was probably the most important network. He has been for yeah, many yeah, years, yeah. yeah. Listen, he's personally responsible for the deportation to death camps of 128,500 Jews. 47,000 from Austria, 44,000 from Greece, 23,500 from France, and 14,000 from Slovakia. And what's especially interesting is that in, in an interview with a German news magazine in 1985, the only interview that we know that he's given in the last 50 years, he was asked if he had any regrets, and he said, yes, he has one regret, he didn't murder enough Jews. <laughs> What about Sandor Kepiro? He tops the most wanted Nazi war criminals list. Uh, he's Hungarian, he lives in Hungary, he was convicted but never punished. Why? Okay, he was convicted for his role in organizing a massacre of at least 1,300 civilians in the city of Novi Sad in northern Serbia. But the problem was, he was tried in Budapest. He wasn't tried for the crime that he committed, but rather for violating the Code of Honor of the Hungarian Gendarmerie. But that's good, because had he been tried for the, for the crime, then we couldn't have him put on trial again. But in any event, what happened was that shortly after the trial was concluded, the Nazis invaded Hungary. And they forced the Hungarians to cancel the convictions. They gave the people promotions, and then they returned to service. And then he ran away to Argentina. Mm -hmm. He was in Argentina for 48 years, Capiro before he went back to uh, Budapest. Mm -hmm. And now we're waiting for a decision uh, any week now on whether or not the Hungarians will put him on trial. And the question is whether the Hungarians have the courage and the political will to prosecute him. Because there's no question about his doubt. He admits being there. And he even said in, in an interview that it was terrible what happened to the Jews, just that he had nothing to do with it. But of course, that's not the case. After the Nuremberg trials, what have been the most important as war criminals trials? Well, among those trials certainly were the case of Adolf Eichmann, 
the individual in charge of implementing all the different stages of what's called the final solution, the Nazis' plan for the mass annihilation of European Jewry. And he escaped to Argentina, was kidnapped there by Israel and brought to Israel, put on trial and uh, ultimately executed. Many people in the world strongly criticize Israel's policies concerning the Palestinians. Can this disagreement with Israel turn into not liking Jews and therefore anti-Semitism? First of all, it's entirely legitimate to criticize the policies of the State of Israel. The State of Israel is not an angel and it's not perfect and we make mistakes. But the question is, how, are these, how is this criticism applied? In other words, is Israel judged by a double standard? Is Israel the only country being singled out for such criticism when far worse violations of human rights are taking place all over the world? Now, in the case of many of the countries criticizing Israel, certainly in the Muslim world, we're talking about countries who turn a blind, blind eye to human rights violations of every country except Israel. So that's anti-Semitism. And this is what we have to fight against. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong of legitimate criticism with Israel, and we have to deal with it, and uh, we have to try and do whatever we can to, to act in such a way that we won't be subject to criticism. You see, they're, in a sense, people who have no respect for human rights are using the language of human rights to attack the only country in the Middle East that has a reasonable record of human rights. What's the key? to have a more tolerant world? The key, I would say, is, is two things. One is education, about the dangers of anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia. And two is a, is, a, is a sensitivity to the other, a sensitivity to people who have a different religion, a different tradition, a different ideas, and different uh, way of life, and respect, respect for that difference. In other words, there's no reason to, to be prejudiced against people simply because they have a different religion or a different language or a different tradition and the like. And the sooner the people learn to overcome those differences, in other words, to turn those differences into something positive rather than negative, there's no question that justice is the foundation that enables tolerance. And without justice, I think it would be very, very hard for a tolerant world to exist. Why bringing criminals to justice is so important? Right, because it basically says that society will not tolerate crimes of this nature. And it's really, it's, it's all about the covenant between government and society. Because the covenant says that the government will do everything to protect people, spare them pain, spare them crimes, spare them violence. And if, God forbid, that violence does take place, those responsible will pay for it. But if that doesn't happen, I mean, the covenant or the, the agreement loses its credibility. And without that credibility and belief in the faith, faith in that agreement, society will, come, will be torn apart. Dr. Zuroff, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Thank you.